to you. So, hi everybody. Um, so, yeah, I'm Kieran from Archaeology Scotland, and I'll be speaking for about 10 minutes ish on um, our new audience project, um, focusing on some of the stuff we did with Jambo um, in Glasgow a couple of years ago. So, um, our new audience project has been running since about 2020. It was impacted by the pandemic, as everything was. Um, and it's funded by HES, so big thank you to them, until um, 2025. Um, and like with everything Archaeology Scotland do, the main sort of point behind this is that it's our shared past, it's everyone's past, and it's something that can kind of bring people together from different communities and different backgrounds and offer people a lot. Um, sure, the reason that you're all here is they're all passionate about archaeology, and um, hopefully something that will come through is that archaeology can kind of, you know, make a difference and give people really positive experiences um, so yeah, that's sort of the kind of main background. Um, so we've been working a lot with um, New Scots. Um, this work is sort of tied into, well, until last year it was the Scottish Government's New Scots sort of integration um, programme and helping people integrate and make social connections um, and then sort of where they found themselves um, in Scotland. Um, I'll be talking mostly about our work at First Hamden, so some of you may have heard about this, I think it kind of got touched on a talk last year. Um, but in the picture there is um, Hamden Bowling Club, so that's where the kind of most of what we'll be talking about happened, in the south side of Glasgow. Um, and the point behind this project, well, we try to use football as a, as a hook, you know, it's the universal language as it gets called, um, and people would kind of be interested in this, they could relate to football. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, more about the history, but it's a very, very significant site in terms of the development of, of football. Um, ironically, a lot of the folk that we had coming along weren't super interested in football, they were actually there for the archaeology, which is quite nice to hear. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, the, you know, it's to bring people together, improve social kind of connections, um, and help people with their sort of physical and med mental um, well-being and place-making, um, so sort of feeling an affinity to the the city, learn more about the city, see new bits of the city that they may never have been to. I'll talk about that a little bit later on, especially post-COVID, um, it's quite important. Um, we've also been running sort of workshops and activities and projects across Scotland um, in Edinburgh with a group called The Welcoming. Um, so they work with sort of newly arrived refugees and asylum seekers and sort of other um, migrants, I guess. Um, we've been up in Aberdeen a fair bit as well with the Grampian Regional Quality Council. Um, and I think it's quite important to sort of illustrate that um, it's not just the Central Belt. The Central Belt gets a lot of attention in terms of charities that support um, refugees and asylum seekers, but places like Dundee, where we've got a project starting in Aberdeen, um, don't get as much um, support. So I think it's quite important that we, we develop work in there. Um, so, yeah, um, the first Hamden project is part of a wider Archaeology Scotland project called Play in the Past. Um, so that's been going on since 2017. Um, and the kind of goal behind that is to help communities um, kind of learn about and investigate and research their local sporting history. Um, again, quite a fair bit of this has been in Glasgow, and I'll talk about a couple of the sites, um, but we've also been working in Edinburgh at the Jimmy, which I think is in, I don't know Edinburgh super well, I think it's George V Park in Edinburgh, um, and with a football team called St Bernard's, who went out of existence, but we looked at their old stadium and stuff, it was really interesting. Um, but I'll mainly talk about Glasgow, um, so the mural up the top, um, that is on the back of the Hamden Bowling Club. So that is the site of First Hamden, which was built in 1873. Um, and it is the first purpose-built international football stadium anywhere in the world. Um, Glasgow was like a hotbed for football. It had the biggest stadiums. Um, and um, yeah, sort of Scotland developed the passing game. So sort of what we know and love is football, sort of Scotland pioneered it. So um, don't listen to England when they say that they invented football. Uh, and it's not. If it's coming home, it's coming to Glasgow. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, this has been an ongoing project. And the first hand is a really, really important site in football. Um, it's, there's a campaign on at the minute run by the Hamden Collective to make um, a sort of square mile in Glasgow a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it's football heritage that's not seen anywhere else in the world at this date. The numbers of people going to the games, the style of football being played, um, it's just kind of, yeah, very, very unique and special. Um, another site we worked at is um, Cathkin Park, so see the picture in the middle? So that was the site of, or the home of Third Lanark, who went out of business in the 60s. Um, but we've been looking at 
their stadium. It's sort of quite kind of contemporary archaeology and really interesting. And the red and white laminate is from um, the changing rooms. But funnily enough, we found the bath in Third Lanark were a bit of a shambles. Um, and there's a story that they got someone in to do the retile the bath and they tiled over the bath plug. Um, <laughs> we didn't find the tiled over bath plug, but we did find the bath. Um, and yeah, that's something that we, we were working there um, last year as well. And the geophysics was also done by Rose Geophysics, um, so big thank you to them. Um, the geophysics results at the top, that is Cathkin Park. So if you see the wee yellow dots, that's goalposts. So the goalposts have moved kind of over time. And if you ever get the chance to visit Cathkin Park, it's quite a unique, special place. There's still terracing um, visible, so you can kind of walk around and you can see that. Um, it's used by the council to, as a nursery, but they never came down to, you know, they never came back to chop down the trees. So it's got a kind of ghostly, atmospheric feel to it. And we worked a lot with people that had, you know, been to watch football matches there and were telling us stories about what it was like to be on the terraces when Third Lanark were playing, I don't know, Celtic or Rangers and there was 50 odd thousand people there. And it's something that the project participants really kind of were able to engage with and found really interesting. Um, so the geophysics results at the bottom, that is First Hamden. Um, so First Hamden was in use from 1873 to about 1884, um, and then it was completely leveled um, to make way for a railway line. Um, and people at the bowling club always said that this was the site of First Hamden. The site basically got lost to time, and it was a myth. Um, until Graham from the bowling club found the map that's just at the bottom in the middle. Um, and that is uh, from 1879, and that's a survey done by the railway company. Um, so it's the only map in existence that tells us where First Hamden was. Um, so that got us thinking, and we wanted to go back and sort of prove this. Um, you know, pro prove it archaeologically by finding it, which we did. Um, so the bottom right picture, that is the foundations of the pavilion. Um, and the pavilion's in the picture, um, the bottom left-hand side there. Um, and yeah, it was quite amazing. We were able to prove that it was there. But the main reason, or one of the most significant reasons, I think, was that um, was the kind of social aspect and the community aspect and the new audience aspect of all this. So we had volunteers from about 13-ish different countries. Um, it's not an exact number, maybe more. Um, and we had around about 59 participants over the course of Hamden and at Cathkin. We worked with Jambo and they came down to excavate as well. And yeah, it's just fantastic to kind of get loads of different people involved in the project. We had worked with quite a number of local charities and organisations. Um, the Welcoming came over to visit. We worked a lot with the Scottish Guardianship Service. So they help support um, young unaccompanied asylum seekers or refugees in Scotland, um, and they were able to learn sort of archaeological photography, do a bit of digging, we played a bit of football as well. Um, and yeah, we also worked with the Gorbals Health Walk. So there was a real mix of people from different backgrounds. There was people that had been born and raised in Glasgow, people that had been in Glasgow for a matter of months. Um, and by lunchtime on the first day, everyone was learning a bit of Arabic um, and a bit of Glaswegian or Scots, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it was a really good sort of positive atmosphere. And I think that's the main thing that especially in this climate with the sort of attitudes that you see in the press and by the government and um, the UK government towards refugees and Islamic, it's a very toxic, poisonous kind of narrative. And in these kind of projects, archaeology or non-archaeology really help people feel at home and make those social connections, make new friends, even if it's just a day that they don't have to worry about their asylum claim or they can take their mind off it for a little bit. That's a really valuable thing um, and that kind of reflected in the feedback we got from people. Um, and yeah, so the kind of bringing people together aspect is quite a bit, and that's also quite ironic, using football in Glasgow to bring people together. Um, <laughs> but in this case, it did work. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and yeah, we worked with, in terms of like the kind of practical aspects of this, um, we covered transport costs, so um, people were given week-long bus tickets, so that would enable them to use the bus um, out with the project. Um, people that are going through the asylum system have got very, very limited funds. So even something small like that can help with accessibility to the project, but also with other things that they've got going on and give them a bit of, uh, sort of freedom, a bit more freedom um, than they have. And um, we worked with, uh, well, a lot of lunches were provided by Milk Cafe. So they are a social enterprise in the South Side that support women refugees. Um, and the lunches were amazing, um, but you know, were suitable to dietary requirements. And it was really good to sort of um, work a lot with local ch other local charities um, as well. So yeah, some of the impact, um, 
Like I mentioned earlier, sort of post-COVID, um, people had been housed in hotels for up to seven months. Um, they were unable to make social connections with people, unable to sort of get out and experience the city, really. Uh, it was quite a daunting um, environment for them to be in. Um, this project was in sort of, maybe should have mentioned, um, summer 2021 was the uh, first sort of dig at Hamden. Um, and a lot of people had been saying that, you know, it was really good to get out, see a new bit of the city. Um, it's a lovely, like, garden and stuff like that. It's a really relaxing, like, nice place. Um, and the atmosphere on site was really good as well, which helped. Um, a lot of people were able to experience archaeology for the first time um, and have been coming back on other projects that we've had around Glasgow, and that's been um, really excellent. Um, one guy's a retired, there's an architect from Yemen, and he did, like, the best, a uh, plan drawn like anyone had ever seen. It was incredible. Um, and he's kind of really passionate about archaeology and we're going to help try and support him to, you know, do courses and um, kind of, you know, follow a path that he wants to follow with archaeology in, in Scotland. Um, people were able to practice English. Again, it's very important. And this is something that helps with college, if they're at ESOL, or um, with applications to remain in the country. Um, and one participant was able to get a place that, this is Kelvin College, but it was actually a place at Strathclyde University. Um, and he was able to speak a lot in this interview about being on the project, and he said that it was very helpful. Um, and we were also able to sort of shine a light on Andrew Watson. So he's the first black international footballer. He played for Scotland, captain Scotland, um, during the 1880s when they were very successful. Uh, lots of big, big victories against England at First Hamden and down in, down in London, um, and by all accounts, he was a fantastic footballer. He was um, born in uh, Guyana um, and, yeah, was a very well-known footballer. And his story, again, was sort of, had been lost, and um, it's a story that's starting to be told a lot more, and we were able to sort of celebrate his story at the excavation. So, um, yeah, so big thank you to everybody that's supported us. Big thank you to Jambo, the South East Integration Network, HESS, the Scottish Refugee Council um, and the groups that we work with elsewhere in Scotland, the Welcoming and uh, the Grampian Regional Equality um, Council. And big thanks to obviously all the volunteers that came along. Hi guys, I'm Benny McKinley. Well, everybody calls me BB because Benny Briggs McKinley is a bit of a mouthful. Um, I work for Jam Jamba Radio. Um, we're the first Scottish radio station for the African audience in Scotland. And we're beamed, we're in Glasgow, but because of the power of the internet, we go all over the world. So I have a show every week, but we have volunteers at the radio stations from all over the world, all over Africa, who are based in Scotland and trying to spread the word. So the idea was to um, create a heritage project to share about archaeology and the heritage um, sector with our audiences. And to the goal, we had goals, we had methods, and we had outcomes. So the goal was to put more African content in the heritage sector, if there wasn't, and also share what was in the heritage sector with our audiences. And we did that, with, um, our idea was to share our findings on archaeology with our audiences and find common threads between the Scottish heritage sector and the African heritage sector. And things, common threads like things like um, magic, masquerade, mythology, oral traditions, burial traditions, things that are quite popular in the Scottish heritage sector and popular in Africa as well. And that kind of tend to, tended to pull people in. So what we did was we created a heritage program every week. And we, we had Jeff from the Society of Antiquaries to tell, so the first thing was what is archeology? span Nobody knew what archeology span was. So we started with that, finding out more, visiting people, visiting sites, and then sharing with audiences. So that was the team, we had a heritage team. And so we found out to what exactly is archaeology, what is the heritage sector, how do we share this with the audiences. So we had this heritage project every week, and um, we visited sites. The first thing we did was visit First Hamden, and we, none of us had ever been in a dig before, so that was quite incredible to see. I'm not going to talk about First Hamden because I think Kieran has gone deeply into that. And then we, told, we, we visited um, Arran, the Isle of Arran, and we went on an actual dig. So the dig was with. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, please forgive me. It was a Neolithical, Neolithic Cursus Kurs Monument, is that correct? <laughs> At Drividoon. And we met with the amazing Dr. Kenny Burphy, and we actually went on an actual dig, and we found shards, didn't we? 
We found shards, and I think we did quite well, Sally, did we? <laughs> and then we went, we, we spent a whole week with um, Dr. Gavin McGregor. I'm sure everybody in this room knows who he is. And we went to King's Caves. We went to Giant's Graves, Macrimore, Brother Castle, Lacranza Quarry. We actually went on a two-hour hike all the way to Lacranza Quarry. We said we're going to we walk. It wasn't a wee walk, it was two hours. And then we went all that way and we got to this stone and that was it, that was it, the stone. I was like, this is it, yes. And you see the markings on it? That tells you where it's from and how old it is. And I was like, this is amazing, two hours to find this, that was great. But, but it was wonderful just delving into the world of archaeology and then coming back every week and sharing with the audiences what we'd found. And then we also, um, we also went to St. Cecilia's Music Hall. I don't know if anybody has been. And we met the inimitable Dr. Sarah Dieters and her husband and her work in the music hall together. All day, just working on different instruments, preserving them, curating them, and just be, I mean, that's the dream. You and your husband all day in this beautiful hall, just working on old instruments, is amazing. And then we found some really old, uh, to us it's old, 500 years is old, but I'm sure to the room, it's, that's nothing, that's like baby instruments. But to us, oh my God, 500 years. And then we found the history behind the instruments and where they came from. And I think we found out that the backpack was African, did we? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so it's Scottish, but is Scottish, is it North African, is it Spanish, is it, well, I'm claiming it's African anyway. So we found all of that and we shared all of that. And then we also went to um, the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. We met, uh, there was a Friedrich Douglass um, installation on his life and works. And apparently Scotland was the founding point of um, the abolition movement. And he was given room here to speak about it and slavery and all of that when he couldn't do that back in his own country, back in America. But Scotland welcomed him and all of that. And so we had a bespoke tour with the curator of that. Um, uh, of the exhibition, that was amazing. And of course, I met Miles um, Greenwood at the Kelvin Grove Museum. So basically, it was every week going out, finding, uh, going to digs, going to sites, meeting with different people, and then finding out more about the sector and bringing that back to our audiences. And then I topped that off by interviewing key figures within the sector. So I had Neil Curtis on my show. I'm sure you know, everybody knows who he is. I keep saying everybody knows who these people are. I, just, I think the archaeological world is a, small one, is a small one, and people tend to know each other. But he was, um, he's the head of museums and special collections at the University of Aberdeen, and they are the ones who are giving back the Benin bronzes back to Nigeria and, you know, and trying to get other countries in Europe to give back their stuff as well. Um, their, their gifts that they took with them when they um, visited Africa back in the day. And then I met with Kate Simpson. Um, I interviewed her, actually. She's a trustee of the David Livingston birthplace. And she focused on the fact that everybody knows David Livingston as this amazing guy who discovered the source of the of the Falls. But there are people, there are local women, African women, who worked with him, who cared for him, who, when he died, preserved his body, brought it back, made sure it was brought back safely to be brought back to the UK, and nobody's telling their stories, so she's telling their stories and researching more about them, and it's just phenomenal. And then, I think one of my most interesting interviews was actually with Andrew, Andrew Jepson, because he just changed careers midlife. He was doing one thing for years, and then in his 40s, I think, he decided to be an archaeologist and went back to school, studied, and now he's doing that, working full-time as an archaeologist, am I wrong? All right. <laughs> So that was really interesting. It was very, very inspirational to share this with the audiences every week. We find, go here, we find that out. We go there, we find that out. We share that back again. It was really, really something quite affirming, life affirming. So what lessons did we learn? Well, what we've done is, by opening this sector up, this world up to our audiences, things have changed. So people who might not have thought about studying, for example, archaeology, are thinking about it now. People are starting to, their career path, they're thinking about where they're going to go. Young people, now they're, I mean, they realize they're, you don't have, as an African, we say you're either a doctor, a lawyer, or a disappointment. But <laughs> now we have people, kids who are thinking, I'm going to be an archaeologist, an archivist, a curator, um, whatever, all the different jobs within the sector. So it's opened up people's eyes more. And then people who are doing their other careers might be thinking of, you know, getting jobs in this sector or studying more in this sector. So people's minds are changing, well, our, our community. And then finally, the knowledge expansion, all the visits we've done, people now think they're joining the different societies, visiting more museums, digs, volunteering at different digs. So it's really 
change things and then we're, we're going to keep this going and just keep sharing whatever we're finding with the people. And the one thing I really, really realized is that this is a small world and archaeologists are really passionate about what they do. And it was really, I didn't know that. I didn't know anything about archaeology before we started this project, but one, the, the way you guys champion each other and share your findings and share with each other and just everybody has everybody's goodwill in mind, it's amazing. So thank you guys very much for inviting us into your world, sharing with us and, you know, opening our eyes to this. Thank you very, very much. So um, thank you very much, um, Kiren and Bibi. I think um, you touch on everything that I was thinking up to this morning that I'm, uh, perhaps I might have mentioned. Um, but I'm just here to talk about Jumbo Radio. I'm a George star and uh, I created Jumbo Radio in the middle of the pandemic. And that was um, the sole aim at that time was to um, interpret and disseminate information about COVID and the new restrictions that were coming up because there's a lot of confusion about that. And if um, anyone is really close to the, uh, especially the African and Caribbean communities, you realize that uh, mainstream media communications is a very challenging on the, um, uh, aspect to understand because there are a lot of people speak m multiple languages and their first thought always comes in the language that they ab absolutely understand better. And uh, to try to interpret all of that information, uh, we, find, we found that it was a bit challenging. So we got um, multilingual presenters like um, BB to come on. They can speak in different languages and in, in, you know, give the Scottish government update information. And we actually, in the course of that, actually um, interpreted um, in three different languages the communication by the um, Scottish government, the chief executive, the chief medical officer, Jason, whom we interviewed. Leech, yeah. Yes, Jason Leach, yes. And he, uh, you know, his um, videos that were coming out from the Scottish government about public health information, uh, we interpreted that in the language so that people can, uh, within our audiences, can understand um, the variety. We broadcast in multiple languages. Um, and the reason for that is because majority of the people in the community will understand basic communication in English, and some will even understand a little bit more. But it's very important to understand how, for us as a radio station, a storytelling platform, how do we connect what we know, or what people know, or how do we bring about dialogue, conversations, discussion, and participation. So it was very important for us to take that that, that, um, that step to look at the multilingual aspect and how that can help with engaging um, n not just existing community members but new audiences as well uh, because they're quite there's an identity which is a growing identity within the Scottish identity as being black and Scottish and this is very important that uh, that means a lot because these are uh, born Scottish kids growing up here know nothing about anywhere else apart from that they know their, where their parents come from and they know the languages that their parents speak so and they know Scottish and if they're born in Glasgow they are absolutely Glaswegians one of them supports Celtic the other one is Rangers and um, all of that so so that dynamics of um, how do we uh, engage it and to answer the question on how do we uh, especially where we're covering, how uh, I'll just open my phone up here so I can get the, I can get the question right. Um, so how do how to build inclusive audiences for Scottish archaeology? As Jumbo Radio, I just want to give you a bit of how fast we've come from starting off in the middle of the pandemic. We now operate at a full scale radio station. We started in the middle of the pandemic. It was just and me working with the team remotely. Everybody was, um, uh, the studio, where right, well, the central point of contact was actually in my bedroom. And uh, that's a story that a lot of people have heard before, different um, projects starting up in the bedroom, but this one is also true. 
because it started in my bedroom and I was staying up um, to 5 a.m. sometimes just waiting for people to send in different stuff because they walk through things to kind of inform the community about COVID, the new restriction and all of that, interpreting different languages. Now, so my duty was to try and put them out to be broadcast. So we moved from the post um, lockdown and the uh, COVID restriction easing off, we moved um, to a studio space. Now, so we started broadcasting from there. And uh, our project, the, our heritage project, was basically, um, you know, uh, the, uh, became a production, a part of, which is a weekly production now, as part of our team, because we had space and uh, to be able to do, um, uh, uh, you know, good productions. Um, and right now, we are not only broadcasting online when we started, we're also available now on DAB in Edinburgh and Glasgow. That's a projection that I kind of uh, made um, at the very, at the, kind of the, the, the first year of uh, Jumbo Radio um, in 2020. And I remember my conversation with Jeff Sanders, um, Dr. Jeff Sanders, on a train when we were heading to um, Aram. Yes, and uh, he was asking, so what's the, what's, what's the plan, what's the future? And I said, uh, well, the projection is in the next five years, we're going to be on DAB in uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh. But we did not wait for five years because we see the importance of the, what we're doing. The growing audience and the, 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 the alternative that we're providing in the broadcast media space, the engagement that we're getting, and the education that we're providing through the knowledge that we go to field and gain, especially when we had the experience of uh, sharing our archaeology um, store, uh, experience uh, with the audience, the impact that is causing. So um, Jumbo Radio is there to work with the sector. And um, this is a slightly older um, figure uh, for monthly listeners, but that's what, you know, where we are, uh, where we were in, in a f um, I think a few months ago, um, well, up to last year. That's our listeners' figures. It's grown now because we've expanded our reach by adding um, the uh, DAB Digital Radio in Edinburgh. Um, now, we've not got the exact figures of that because um, a Raja uh, producing a quarterly report, which will get, and we quite um, based on feedback from our programs and our, our engagement with the audiences, we kind of estimate that you know there's a growing um, listenership in Edinburgh, as is, is, is also on the DAB in Glasgow. Um, but these figures that you see here are only coming from our online platform, which is people accessing um, Jumbo Radio on a website and on our mobile app. Um, so we are a visual radio station, and this is kind of deliberate because it, it, it's very important that um, to create a sense of visibility and representation, it's important that um, uh, people like BB that are on the radio can be recognized on the street. So <laughs> they, 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 you know, to share that story. And because we also want to create a sense where um, a, um, young people that are, gr uh, are listening to the radio are able to see uh, opportunities from what um, we're doing and the conversation so they can feel a bit um, relevant or related to the people that are delivering those information. And so that's why we, are, we choose the option to be a visual uh, radio station. Again, Jumbo Radio can be listened anywhere as a, a BB a, a said earlier. And uh, you know we are online, so um, we do have an audience in Kenya, believe it or not, and in, in Nigeria, massive audience there. I don't know what they're listening to, but I think, I think, <laughs> I think uh, but we try to keep our content um, to be Scottish focus, you know. So BB African News Magazine show talks about highlights some of the. Uh, the, 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 the stories of the African diaspora in Scotland. And um, we can go beyond, obviously, it's good to get good stories from different parts of the world. Uh, we do have a good listening um, numbers as well, and people engaging with the radio station uh, from England, which is quite interesting. And I have to say, I've not confirmed this yet because I've tried to make a bit of research on that, but we've had people in, uh, listeners from England that contacted us that nothing exists in England like Jumbo Radio in England, so we see, we see here to verify that information. But we're quite proud to be pioneering something in Scotland, and I think, um, you know, the sector, the heritage sector, the archaeology um, uh, sector uh, has a unique opportunity as well to 
to work with us to build a new audience, um, build a new talented workforce, diverse, inclusive. Uh, so it's really important uh, for to use a platform like ours that we are a growing platform. We are not, well, well, this is our third year, so we're two and a half years old. Um, so building that and working and learning because we are, at, all of us that work at the radio station are, are very open minded in terms of learning and uh, we think with education from the, you know from the different sectors and key players who help us to, to grow and develop a new uh, a workforce a diverse inclusive workforce and new audiences as well so it's a very good time to be engaged with um, involved with jumbo radio from the ecology sector again the community the african and caribbean community doesn't have a geographical location and that's why radio jumbo radio is really working for them in terms of bringing people together. Because we are not anywhere, but we are everywhere. So um, in that sense, the radio is like a meeting point for the, 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 the population, which is a growing population as well in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, Aberdeen, uh, you know, all those cities. Um, so we, we try, we, we, we're mobilizing that. I mean, we have volunteers in Aberdeen for the radio station. Ask me what they're doing at the radio station. <laughs> what did they do in Abedin for Jumbo Radio? Um, but that's because we can now work remote. The technology has made that allowance for us. But it also creates a sense of um, local connections because that means we, you know, uh, we're going to go to Abedin. We know uh, we have a volunteer there. We can have local um, information. And they can also engage in a, uh, well, they also engage in what we're trying to do. And with our different partners in different sectors, we can. Uh, we can work a lot more to build or because we never know where the talent is hidden until you start scouting for them. Football is very good at scouting at ta uh, for talent, but I don't think there's any other sector or industry in the world that's good as football to scout <laughs> talent. So um, we develop that kind of uh, um, you know, um, knowledge and ability to be able to scout for talent. Uh, we at Jumbo Radio believe that when you expose people to an opportunity, you expose people to things that they are not used to. With time, they will get, develop interest, and with time, they will take up the opportunity. So that is our core belief, that it, is not, it doesn't matter what people's aspirations, ambitions are. Some of it would have been one thing, especially when BB talked about in, the, in a complete African household, they think you either be a doctor, an accountant, or what else again? All the disappointment, yes, and uh, some of us have been disappointed in the family because we wanted to play football. <laughs> but we had, uh, yeah, so um, so it's, it, we believe that it's really important to engage, to expose people. Before engaging them a lot, it's also to expose them to the opportunities, to, to things that they are not familiar with. Um, archaeology, will not, I, wouldn't have, I, I can't even believe that I'm talking about archaeology, to be honest with you, uh, because that wouldn't have crossed my mind until we got involved with um, uh, 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 the Digit uh, 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 Scotland. Scotland. And, you know, that opened up a complete different mindset to me and, and you know and for us i've been contributing in some of the um, heritage uh, uh, program to conversation and sharing my experience as well as many people in the team and uh, 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 who've also uh, experienced that so i think um again one of our uh, I think I've talked about social impact already in terms of exposing people, but it's bringing, uh, as a platform, bringing people together and then exposing them to opportunities or things that they might not be used to and continue to do that with time, people develop that interest and they can take that uh, opportunity um, to, to uh, perhaps excel. So we do really encourage, um, so we do encourage a lot of, um, sectors that are not really um, common within the population, like archaeology, for example. We really want to be working with these sectors because it's important that we expose the um, people from our community to be able to gain an understanding because knowledge is really power, as everybody knows, but without that exposure to knowledge, 
it just means that people are all stuck in the same place. And then you get this high unemployment in uh, black Afro-Caribbean communities just because people are not exposed to many information. One thing that they know is to work, one thing that will be very common and we, that people will know a lot is to work in a particular sector. And that sector become now overcrowded, or there's too many people there, but just because they are not exposed to any other choice. Now, the choice would have been a very good excavator, um, working in the archaeology sector, like the outdoor, digging the, um, uh, the first Hamden, you know, getting all that knowledge, bringing back to the community and educating people, but because they're not exposed to it. So Jumbo Radio is your partner to do that. And um, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that our, our Jumbo Radio workforce is mainly young people. And this is also kind of intentional, uh, so apart from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the grandpa of Jumbo Radio. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, so it, yeah, it's mainly young people. And the, the reason for that is to, um, and most of them don't come from a broadcasting background like myself. Um, they have not previous experience like me and BB, uh, but they are doing a wonderful job because they are very passionate about what they, they're doing, what they're saying, and they're also really open to learning because we create that conducive environment where it is about learning and it's about um, uh, taking opportunity, exposing yourself to things that might not be, uh, you've never been aware, of. might not be something that you've thought about or ever known about. So it's really good for, um, for you know, to work with partners in the archaeology sector to be able to expose opportunity to our African and Caribbean uh, community. Thank you. <laughs>